So um, Square is a company that focuses on supporting the technology of nonprofits. And um, in particular, um, we focus on building CRMs, um, constituent relationship management systems for nonprofits. Um, the technology that we use happens to be a technology that's available, but as Eli did a great job um, explaining, there's so many technologies out there available to you. And our job here is to help you navigate um, what technology is right for you, what you can get through TechSoup and the relationship maybe where there's some licensing um, wave um, waving happening there that might help you out. Um, but we're here to help you and support you. And um, we in, I think it was September or October, partnered with TechSoup to be the North Texas community organizers of TechSoup and the Net Squared events and Tech for Good. So we are um, here to help organize this community. Um, if any of you, particularly those of you in the North Texas area know of other resources that want to do educational programming, please reach out to us, let us know. We'd love to get as many people in this conversation as possible. Um, and for today's event, um, we've got Peter Petrick, who is the founder and CEO of Square and Adam Schaefers, who is our lead um, DevOps system admin person who is going to be um, sharing with you some of our learnings about cybersecurity and in particular, how they relate to nonprofits and specific issues that nonprofits have faced in that area. So I will um, be quiet now and leave it to the experts on cybersecurity because that's why we're here. Uh, thank you, Adrian. And uh, welcome again, everybody. Um, as Adrian mentioned, my name is Peter Petrick. I'm uh, the founder of Square. We've been in uh, really in North Texas. This is where the home base is. Uh, we've been here since 19, oh, actually 2008, sorry. I was trying to count the, the decades plus uh, since 2008 and supported a lot of uh, local nonprofits as well as uh, nonprofits uh, and, and other organizations, NGOs across the US. Um, and as Adrian has mentioned, uh, while we do have a preferred set of tools, a lot of our involvement is in the open source community in particular. Um, today's uh, conversation applies regardless of uh, whichever tool you use or uh, specifically, it's not specific to you know, a particular industry or particular efforts that, uh, that you're making with your organization. Um, so with that, uh, Adam, as Adrian said, is... Uh, is our lead uh, sysadmin slash DevOps person. And for those of you that don't know what DevOps stands for is um, developer operations kind of, it's being shortened in the, in the community and in the industry. Um, but basically think of a, a, a person that's uh, truly kind of the behind the curtains of making the websites work, making the servers secure, uh, making sure that the, everything, basically when you need to talk to somebody uh, at Adam's level is usually not a good thing. Uh, these are the people that are behind the, the curtain, and you hope you never have to talk to them because if, if you do, that generally means there is a problem. They're, they're the people. It's kind of like insurance. You never know you need it until, until you really need it, right? Uh, so uh, we spent a lot of time uh, going through and making sure we adapt uh, this presentation to be specific uh, to the audience and to, to the level of knowledge. We're not going to be getting into uh, some deep, dark secrets of servers or, or the internet. Um, so Adam, with that, I'm going to hand it over to you to kick us off. All right. Thank you, Peter. Um, hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. And um, I work for Square.com remotely. And it's my favorite job I've ever had. Um, there's a lot of technical stuff. But like Peter said, um, this talk is for everybody. And there's a lot of things that we can do to protect ourselves, to protect our organizations. And um, <clears throat> I just want to go over um, all of that. And so basically starting out, but first of all, this is being recorded, um, but also feel free to chime in if you have any questions along the way. If I say anything that's unclear, um, I would feel a lot more comfortable, I think, if we're all interacting together in this. Um, otherwise, I have a bunch of slides and a bunch of content, and I'll just keep going through. Um, <clears throat> so the first point I think that I want to kind of make is that this is about all of us and we lock the doors on our houses of our homes we for security and we close the curtains on our windows that's privacy um, 
our lives being online more and more, uh, especially with COVID and everything, um, how do we do that digitally is the question. And then also maybe what's required of us um, of the law, the legal aspects. Um, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide, Peter. Um, the point of this slide statistics basically is that it's a big deal. Um, it's $3.5 billion lost to cybercrime, but what does that mean like for us? And <clears throat> is this just like, is that what happens to big corporations like, I don't know, Walmart or Amazon or something, or can this happen to a nonprofit? How can this affect us? Um, the answer is, I think that, yeah, it can, it affects all of us. And um, our organizations are on the line too. Um, so the next slide, Peter, please. Thank you. So to define our terms, digital privacy, um, what are we talking about is the first thing. Um, does anyone wanna say or have any ideas? Okay, so privacy is our personal information, basically. We're talking about email addresses, phone numbers, social security numbers, credit cards, bank accounts, first, last names, physical addresses, et cetera, data or personal information, and we wanna keep it safe. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so security. So for example, um, with security, if my laptop gets stolen, that's a real threat scenario. Um, laptops get stolen every day. Cell phones get misplaced or lost or picked up by who knows. Um, my private information may be on that laptop or other people's private information. But if the hard drive is encrypted, and it requires a password to log in, then at that point, that encryption and that password, hopefully a strong one, is protecting or securing my privacy and the privacy of everyone on my computer. So that's a simple example of security and privacy working together to achieve this common goal. Go ahead, Peter. So the disclaimer is, I'm not a lawyer. Um, my idea is to help us prevent things from happening and prevent needing to talk to lawyers. I do wanna go over just quickly the basics of the legal stuff. So there's the GDPR that protects citizens in the European Union, the CCPA, it protects people in California. Those are general policies about for companies that are collecting private information. In the EU, they have to opt in. In California, they have to be providing Californians a way to opt out. Um, I think more importantly, most states in the USA where I am have a some type of reasonable security procedures and practices law. And so I wanna go over how we can meet those expectations of reasonable security procedures and practices. Like that's what the law states, but that's really general and generic. And hopefully we never end up in a position with our organization where we're being asked if there was a data breach, well, were you reasonably secure? And did you have best procedures and practices in place? Um, because that will be at the discretion of the judge 
and that's never a position we want to be in. So this presentation is really about how to prevent this from happening in the first place. But I'm gonna go over the simple things we can do to give us reasonable security and practices. So with the common, or, I mean, a case study, an example is BlackBot. If, if anyone's heard of BlackBot, this is not a, a bad BlackBot or good BlackBot. It's just an example of it. BlackBot had a data breach in 2019. <clears throat> and BlackBot is a large corporation, I think, and they um, serve or work with 45,000 nonprofits. So we're talking about serving millions of people. Um, they're one of the largest providers of financial and fundraising technologies to nonprofits. And they got hacked. They had a data breach in 2019. So at work, we call this a dumpster fire. And there's a couple more slides, Peter, you can go through them kind of quickly. <clears throat> and it's not a position we want to be in. If, uh, if, if there's a, like a data breach uh, affecting 45,000 nonprofits, um, <clears throat> what ended up happening is that I think people may be suing or losing trust in those nonprofits because they lost their data. And then the nonprofits in turn have to come together and sue BlackBot, who was responsible for all of this. And it's a big mess. There's 23 class action lawsuits underway right now. And so the question is like, how does a nonprofit come back from that? Or how did this happen? How do we prevent it from happening in the first place to make sure something like this doesn't happen to us? Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just interject really quickly. Uh, what Adam is also pointing out kind of uh, indirectly here is that oftentimes as we think about data security isn't just about your organization or your laptop necessarily. And part of the reason why we chose to do, uh, uh, do this particular case study is because it's a well-known tool, but it's a third-party tool, right? So if your website even has a contact form or it has a, um, any kind of interaction where you're integrating third-party or maybe you're putting something in a Google form or Google Sheets and that data is flowing through a third-party, uh, basically, uh, I remember when, uh, on TV, it was like, you know, it's it's eight o'clock. Do you know where your kids are, right? Uh, and, and this is kind of like a 24 seven is, uh, do you know where your data is flowing through? Uh, so even though BlackBot may not be, or this particular case study may not be you, your organization or your individual uh, device, phone, laptop or something like that getting hacked, uh, the third party, it's not good enough to just say, well, we just trusted them. Uh, understanding how they're protect how the how the third party providers are protecting your data and your constituents' data is uh, is the real highlight. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, and please feel free to keep jumping in here. Um, so, how were they hacked? How did this happen? Go ahead. So, not by traditional means. Basically. They did not have a lack of IT guys at work. Um, tech was actually BlackBot's thing there. And um, it's supposed to be their expertise. And it is their expertise. So how did this happen? Was it that they didn't have antivirus? Well, Windows 10 and Mac OS both come with antivirus installed by default nowadays. Was it that their operating systems are out of date? None of that stuff. Um, they automatically update themselves. It's deception. So more and more cyber attacks are becoming about deception, the art of deception. And <clears throat> so the idea is there's social engineering, phishing, and data ransom. I want to talk about those three things. That's exactly what happened to BlackBot and how we can protect it from happening to ourselves. So social engineering is the idea that 
people are the weakest link in every security organization. What happens is people, um, a social engineer can maybe pose as like somebody in a position of authority over your organization or over your computer or your internet, or your utilities, your telephone, um, or they might pretend to be somebody they're not sending you a fake email from your boss or something that would be a type of phishing email. We're gonna get into that. Um, so we have to understand, first of all, that a lot of the modern cyber attacks are psychological and not necessarily technical. Um, before we go on to this, I was thinking that we all, a lot of it too is when it's, you can't, I think you can't emphasize the social engineering part enough. Like we really have to think deep down inside about ourselves, like about how we're vulnerable. Because I think things I was thinking about is we tend to be lazy or indifferent. It's not that we're dumb. It's just like we're in a hurry all the time. Like we are really busy at work. We got this email. It looks legitimate. I'm being asked to provide this piece of information or this certain, do this certain task for my boss or something. And I'm just gonna click through it, click the button. I need to log in on this website really fast and get this done. Okay, got it. But sometimes we're vulnerable when we're in a hurry, um, there's urgency or stress, or we're trying to keep up a reputation or an offer sounds really good. These are all types of psychological vulnerabilities that we have as people and we just need to be aware of them and if those feelings are coming up it's a good idea to slow down and just analyze the situation maybe verify the communications using another communication platform like if i'm suspicious of an email i'm gonna make a quick phone call what's a five minute phone call to protect everyone's data well, go ahead and one example one example I was going to uh, share is uh, as Adam and I were preparing for this presentation, literally as we went through uh, the slides and the examples and everything else, my phone rings just as we hung up from from our internal call a couple of days ago, and my phone rings, and it's got this automated message that says, "Hey, um, Amazon has you know your Amazon order or something something you're being charged you know 129 dollars, um, stay on the line for a representative." Now. We got quite a few people here on the call. I'm assuming everybody's at some point ordered something from Amazon or, or probably now that we're uh, largely stay at home, we're probably ordering more than usual, right? So a phone call like that comes in and I'm thinking, what did I order from Amazon? I mean, like, I, I don't even know how many orders I'm, I'm expecting or anything like that. But so I waited on, on the line until the, the representative came on and uh, they started quizzing me on different things and i said well which order are you calling in regards to right so it's it's one of those kind of trust but verify uh, situations where uh did i expect this phone call uh a lot of times when uh, a phone call like this comes in like adam said you can use a, a different method to contact um but another option you might uh, you might want to use when you receive a phone call from somebody asking for information uh, a, either ask them something that they can verify that they are who they are, that they know what they're supposed to know. Uh, and that's one part of it. And uh, on more sensitive things, like if I get a phone call or if you get a phone call from, a, let's say, a credit, somebody claiming to be from your credit card company, you can go and grab the credit card, look at the phone number on the back and say, you know what, I will call you back. And hang up on the call that was initiated externally coming to you and now you can make a phone call going out and you know at that point for sure that you're calling uh the the credit card company right and at that point they they can verify you you can validate and say okay i got a call that there was fraud on my credit card is that really the case right so social engineering again um comes in many flavors and uh, i would say all of us are subject to uh, to some kind of a social engineering attempt uh, many times throughout the month, even without probably realizing. Uh, a lot of it probably ends up in our spam, et cetera. 
but there is many, many opportunities for us to be exposed to social engineering. And we'll get to some specifics about it, such as, you know, answering security questions. You know, what's your mother's uh, maiden name? What's your first pet's name? What's the first city you lived in? Um, because those, uh, while they're called security questions, uh, they don't provide as much security as we tend to uh, think they do. Back to you, Adam. Thank you, Peter. So we can move on to the next slide. So social engineering is gonna underlie various types of phishing attacks. Um, basic phishing, I think we've all seen, like when we get the email and it's often poorly written, often the domain name is misspelled often has a strange attachment um etc however there's more advanced types of phishing that we need to be aware of and that's what i want to get into next so here's an example i just did a quick Google search looking for them. Just make a note that they can look really well designed. They can have all the company logos. Usually they have a suspicious link and then like click it, log in. And you think that there, there's a reason like this one says review your information or it might be even like a reverse psychology move where it's like, your account has been compromised, click here if this was not you. And sometimes Google really sends me those if it thinks someone's trying to log into my account or if I'm logging in from a different location than I normally do. So we get real ones and fake ones and they can look a lot alike. This one's pretty obvious in my opinion because it says it's from the Pentagon and what's American Express doing there and what's a dot ci and domain name but about that i'm going to show you guys that actually the from address can be anything and it will not necessarily even go to your spam box here's another one from paypal for example and again some of these examples might be uh, may appear benign. Um, we recently uh, helped an organization who got an email from um, uh, from their domain registrar. Uh, so basically their URL like square.com, you have to renew periodically the, the, the domain registration uh, separate from where it's hosted and everything else. And uh, by now, I think all of us realize that the having control of the domain, there is only one of those, right? It's like your phone number. Uh, and somebody sent them an email saying, oh, your, uh, uh, your domain has not been renewed. Um, you know, you're 30 days past due. If you don't click here and pay, uh, you know, the, the domain's going to expire. And so they, again, there, there's a lot of commonalities in these kind of, um, in these kind of spear phishing and and uh, social engineering and, and all of those uh, elements, which is generally they tend to induce a sense of urgency uh, and some kind of severity, some kind of impact that's gonna happen. If you don't act by this, then uh, these severe consequences are going to happen. And obviously if it was a real email, which sometimes we do, whether it's you know, GoDaddy or Name Silo or uh, ICANN or something, you know, whoever registers your domain. And part of the, part of the challenge nowadays is there is literally thousands of companies that are domain registrars, right? So if your organization, you might have one main URL, but you might own 10, 15, 20 other domains that expire at different times. They might be even with different registrars. And so when an email like that arrives, it's, it's very challenging sometimes to realize, okay, is this a real email or is this not? Um, so, uh, so just, some examples to connect the dots about what we're kind of talking about, kind of the theory and, and showing some examples to some that you might have seen in your real life. And I can see the, the chat on my secondary screen here is, uh, is being very active. So thank you for sharing your examples. Back to you, Adam. Right, thanks, Peter. So basically, one thing I would really point out or advise to keep an eye on is 
um, email account emails because often our email accounts are tied to other more important accounts that we think of, like maybe the company website or, or CRM that where I can log in and it has all my organization's contacts. And that's like the last thing we ever want to lose. Um, they're not necessarily going to fish for that. Maybe they're just going to send me a, a Google Office or an Office 365 um, phishing email because they know that if I can get that, then maybe I can use the password reset to um, gain access to something more valuable than just an inbox. So that's something to keep an eye on. Um, <clears throat> it gets scary right here where we're talking about advanced phishing. It's going to use social engineering. And if you're targeted by some wannabe hacker or just like someone with too much time on their hands during COVID, they figure out how to send fake emails. It's not hard to do. And what if they picked me or my organization as a direct target? Um, they might even do some research, like probably everyone in my organization or most of them are on LinkedIn. And so they can get names, titles, what everyone's doing, who might regularly contact who. We can do some recon. And then they're going to pick someone and target them directly. That's called spear phishing. It's focused. Um, very related to business email compromise, the third one. Um, and the key, the, the key parts to realize here is that, you know, you might think or one of your employees or whoever is associated, a lot of times this happens uh, that we see it uh, in organizations and they're volunteers, right? A relatively easy target, um, doesn't, may not even have a organizational email or something like that. And, and many people will say, well, it's, it's not that big deal. Like, you know, if somebody sends me an email, I have... I have very little to provide, or I, I don't have that much that much data, right? And uh, and what we have to be cognizant of is this is not necessarily about us as individuals. It's about the data and the access that we have. So it's that second layer, third layer, um, because if somebody were to get into into let's say your computer, or your email, or your um, cell phone company, or any any of your accounts, again. Nobody's quite interested in, you know, what are the contacts on your phone or what contacts are who you emailed from your Gmail account. That's not the key part here. The key part is where is your Gmail account or Yahoo or Hotmail or whatever you're using? Where is that link to? What password reset can I initiate that's going to go to that email? Um, it's that next layer and the layer after that. That's the, that's the really important part. And uh, a lot of organizations that we've seen is they consider the volunteers almost like this ancillary thing that nobody thinks about. Yet those very people, even if they have read-only access into an internal system, right? Maybe it's somebody that's providing some kind of support or some kind of care or something like that, just being a, uh, being a supportive volunteer for an organization, but you're directing them to your website to say, okay, well, go here and uh, maybe read only information. Well, that means they have a, a vector of attack for tapping into the database. And if they get into their email and have username and password, they can start, start extrapolating a lot of information very quickly. That's right. At this point in the presentation, I had an idea of sending an email um, from Adrian to Peter, but it would be me who does it all. Um, yeah. I don't know if you're able to, sh to share that, Peter, or if you're not set up for that, regardless of the point stands that an email can be spoofed easily. Yeah, I don't, I don't have that set up, but we've done, again, in our preparation, and, and uh, we can uh, record a short video maybe and, and share it when we publish uh, the, this recording uh, and some screenshots of that. Uh, but again, most people tend to think, and I remember, I'm going to date myself here, back in the 90s, uh, there used to be emails going around, you know, Bill Gates is going to pay you $10 for every person to whom you forward this email or whatever, which, again, back in the 90s was very believable, and a lot of people would forward it. And I remember one time uh, somebody forwarded it to me, and I replied to that email, but I changed the email headers. 
which is all the from to and everything else that said that I was Bill Gates, right? <laughs> um, and everybody started all getting excited because they, they literally thought they were gonna get whatever, you know, $10 per forwarded email or whatever that was. And uh, the scary part of that is, again, this was back in the mid to late nineties when I, when I was doing this. Um, and again, was doing it obviously to teach people a lesson back then, but the scary part is 20 plus years later today, uh, we still have that same problem. And that's just because the way the internet was designed, the way email was designed, et cetera, et cetera, it was never meant to go to the scale and to the kind of utility that we're putting it through its paces today. Um, and the lesson still stands today, just because somebody sends you an email, like we saw a couple of emails here, right, that Adam was pointing out that it's a PayPal letter, for example, on here, and it says uh, petersonfamilycairo.com or the previous email where it's American Express, but it's coming from a completely unrelated domain. Well, point stands that if we wanted to, we could re replicate any kind of email in the from field. Uh, so don't make the assumption just because, let's say a follow-up email comes from Adam or Eli or somebody, if it comes from techsoup.org, you can't make the assumption that it actually came from there. Uh, that's a pretty scary proposition to think about is that you never really know when that email shows up in your inbox that it is actually from the person that the email claims to be from. That's right. And like at Square, we do implement the latest um, email technologies to help verify them. It's called SPF and DCAM and DMARC. But even there, with all of that implemented, I'm still able to send emails spoofed from my laptop at home, from to like from my boss to my coworkers that say like, "Congrats, you're employee of the month," and it'll even have his picture that automatically shows up. It'll have his signature, um, and unless you're trained in how to analyze the headers, and even then, it's still super complicated, like. My research in, in emails, it actually, it scared me how easy it still is to spoof an email. So my main recommendation about emails is never send confidential information over email. That's, if, that, if I had an organization, that would be a company policy. We would have a more secure means of communication. However, we're going to need email because like Peter was talking about, it's kind of a legacy technology that we just can't get away from. The world depends on it too much. So and, I like and, to just assume email content may be public. And again, a lot of times people say, and again, not to not to pick on anybody in particular, but a lot of, you know, obviously everybody knows about, you know, uh, let's say Gmail, right? Or and many people because Gmail offers services to where you can have your own domain, but it's still hosted on, on the same infrastructure. And sometimes people say, well, that's fine. I, I'm not worried about where my data goes or, or whatnot because I don't use Gmail. Well, the latest statistic I saw was 46% of, of email globally goes through Gmail servers because chances are whether you are on or your organization is on using Gmail, um, one of the recipients of that email is likely on there, right? So it's not just what, and that's that's the scary part or the, the eye-opening part really about cybersecurity is you can be doing everything right and you still have very little control about what's going on, right? So, uh, you know, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm happy to take the any questions or input in the chat, you know, the question to you is, what are you doing to educate, train, make your uh, team members in your organizations aware? Um, maybe you're a volunteer. And, and I would like to actually kind of create a bigger group of these people and just call them constituents to your organization, right? And again, so that could be an employee, that could be a volunteer, that could be a consultant, that could be a board member, right? all the different constituents that your organizations have, wh what are the different vectors of attack that you need to make them aware and educate them? And it sounds very scary. And like Adam said, email is not a secure, uh, secure mean of communication. Thanks, Peter. We can go to the next slide.
so what happened to uh, Black Bod was actually after they were targeted through phishing, probably like we were talking about a spear phishing, a business email compromise, something directly targeted with to uh, really be deceptive. I doubt they clicked on something that originated from some weird part of the world or, or far away. It was all misspelled where, but I think that it was probably a direct attack and that <clears throat> that it was probably spelled properly. Everything was had the company logos. It might've had um, a login link to their company website and it might have been appearing from someone who was a person of trust. So after that type of phishing attack, what it led to was a data ransom. So a data ransom is when they get the data and then they, they take it from you, they delete it off your company website servers or from your computer if that's what they gained access to. And then they encrypt it and they won't give it or they'll just leave it encrypted in place. And they won't give you the decryption um, keys or passwords without money. Um, the question is, did they really get the data? Did they really encrypt it in the first place or is it a trick? Um, another question is if we pay, will they really give us the data back? Um, or will they, will they give it part of, part of it to us back and then um, ask for more money? It's, it's a lose-lose from the get-go. So the idea is we wanna prevent this from ever happening. In Blackbot's case, they did pay it. And, and the, the, we're, we're telling you a lot and we're gonna get, as a matter of fact, next slide, uh, is gonna have a number of uh, recommendations that, uh, of, of actions you can do to protect yourself. But we're trying to lay a ground here of um, what is out happening in the world and, and the things we're talking about. And, and a lot of you, again, appreciate your comments in the chat. A lot of you are sharing that you're already experiencing these things. What we're talking about and what we're saying happen, is happening to big companies or you know data ransom. I'm, some of us have probably heard of the cases where a hospital had to shut down because their data got um, encrypted or entire counties had to shut down or school districts, et cetera, right? In, in, our, in many of the organizations that we deal with, people will say, well, we're just a small organization. We only have you know 20 people here. Who would care about us, right? And what we have to be aware of, and we try to impart this on the organizations that we work with, is to say the level, you know, whether somebody's going after a corporation that has 10,000 employees or going after your organization that has 10 employees, the, the level of effort or the level of the, the barrier to entry is almost zero. As a matter of fact, it takes way much more effort to social engineer a much larger corporation and get into their network than send something to, to you. And the, again, the cascading effect, the domino effect of getting into an organization with 10 employees and where they're all hooked up and the third party relationships and everything else, that's the, that's the part that's really relevant. If, um, if you've been online for a couple of decades, you know spam used to go uh, only to specific people, but then it started trickling down to individual user accounts, right? Because again, the barrier to entry and the cost to send out that one additional email or million additional emails was virtually negligible. And that's where we are today, whether it's with social engineering or phishing, or whether it's with data ransom is, yes, the hackers and the bad guys are gonna go after the big targets first, uh, but what's happening there is only a month or a year or two away from what's going to start happening to it, to us as individuals, much less our organizations that are kind of in between those two extremes. Uh, but uh, we're going to see a lot more individuals who are suddenly going to open up their laptop and it's going to say, hey, your data has been locked. You got to pay us X. And it may be, you know, in the grand scheme of things like a hospital or a school district, they will have to pay millions. Um, the, the, the thieves, they know that they can't ask you for a million dollars, um, but uh, they will ask you for hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, thousand dollars, which could be a big, uh, big amount to you. And if you combine all the individual ones, um, the consequences of that are pretty substantial. So, um, and as Adrian just pointed out in the chat is it's all digital data. There is no way 
to prove that you've deleted the zeros and one off the hard drive. Like literally, there's no way to know if somebody made an extra copy. There's no way to know if they're selling it on, on, the, on the dark net somewhere. There's just no way to know. You might still unlock your data, but you, don't, you have no idea where that data might show up one, two, three, five years from now. Thanks, Peter. Another consideration would be, um, does your organization or the ones you partner with in the tech side of things have insurance that covers uh, these types of scenarios? All right, we got about uh, yeah. 11 more okay. minutes, Adam. So let's go through these five Bye. things that uh, everybody can do right now so that uh, we give them a great value. Got it. So five things we can do. Next slide, please. One is protect from physical theft. Um, so we can do that by encrypting our devices, our cell phones, our laptops, and making regular backups. I recommend encrypted backups offsite at a secure location. There's a link in this slide and the slides will be made available um, afterwards. And so then you can download them and click the links if you need it, more information or resources. And a, and a quick tip, and you can Google this on, uh, I use an iPhone, but I'm sure Android has a similar feature. If I take my phone and I hit the power button, I have it, there is a setting in, in, the, in the operating system and it, you don't have to unlock the phone or anything. If I hit my power button five times in sequence, uh, one after another, right? So this is, it automatically locks my screen and it says, okay, is this an emergency? Do you need to call emergency services, SOS? Or is this a medical thing and, and show the medical ID, right? So this is a great thing to know that if, uh, if you're in a position where uh, maybe there's some physical theft happening or something like that. You can just reach in your pocket or purse or wherever you're carrying your phone, hit that power button five times, and it'll automatically lock your phone. And the the only way to unlock the phone at this point, even if I cancel out of it, is it's going to say enter your passcode, right? So they can't just take your fingerprint or put, put it up to your face. Now they have to have, if they steal the phone, they would have to have the physical password. It's much, much more difficult uh, to unlock the phone if you do that. So that's just another kind of a self-protection uh, quick way to, to protect yourself. The second thing I'd recommend is email scanning for phishing emails. Um, most email is scanned for viruses nowadays, but there are providers, <clears throat> there are providers that pr provide more advanced detection for phishing and stuff. And so I recommend um, either a third party like premium G Suites, Office 365 or Amazon Workmail, or if you're partnering, partnering with like a web hosting organization that handles your email as well, I would ask them if they're using R spam D email scanning, which is gonna get you covered. And I recommend R spam D, it's good stuff. The next one is DNS filtering. Um, so, we can install an app on our phones and modify a few settings on Mac OS or Windows. And what can happen is every time a domain name is resolved, which means when you type in like www.google.com, not only that do these services check that it really is google.com, which is what DNS is supposed to do, but it also checks to see if you're accidentally clicking on a malware or a phishing type of website. And so Cloudflare and Quad9 both provide a free service that you can set up. Add those links there. They provide video tutorials. It only takes a few minutes to set up all the apps on your phones and on your laptops. I highly recommend it. Password managers are actually really great for this because if we regularly use a password manager to log into our regular websites, if we accidentally click on a website that's a phishing website, the first clue is gonna be that it's not going to offer to fill out the form for us with our password for that site that we usually go to. Also, a lot of them, I know Google Chrome will automatically um, offer to give you a generated strong password. So the days of coming up with a unique password 
and then remembering it. And then all the websites require like a different type of password with a certain amount of capital and lowercase letters and symbols and numbers. And it gets really hard to remember all your passwords. Like if you use a password manager, it's really easy to forget about all that and just let it, let your computer work for you. I highly recommend it. And you hear a lot about people saying, you know, have these long, complex, elaborate passwords. Um, the, and, and, and sometimes people do that and then they reuse that same complex, elaborate password in multiple, multiple, multiple places. Uh, here's a quick thing. I, I would highly recommend you choose distinct passwords and then use a password manager and you can keep them simpler, right? You don't have to go into all sorts of, uh, you know, weird characters and everything like that, but using distinct passwords, even if they're simpler and less complex is much better than using one complex password and reusing it across multiple websites. Why? Because if there is a breach, that complex password is gonna get passed around on the dark web and the scripts and methods to test that password into your Amazon account, into your email account, into your credit card account, into all of these, they can run literally millions of these in a day for your username password combination across multiple different sites. And they know 99.9% .9 of the time, they're gonna hit and say user invalid or password invalid because you may not even have an account there, but it's that 0.01% when they hit and it says, oh, Bobby's account, uh, you know, what's it, what's the password, right? And the next thing is gonna say, oh, what was your first pet's name, right? And a quick Google or LinkedIn or Facebook profile uh, will provide that. And, uh, and suddenly multiple of your accounts are compromised. All right. And so the fifth thing I recommend is two-factor authentication. Um, this one's a bit more complicated, but basically once it's set up to log in on your website, you log in like you always do, but then it will ask you for a code from your phone. And it helps. It does improve security. And if you get that set up, it will help. However, it's not foolproof. Um, there is There are sophisticating phishing websites that have no problem with two-factor authentication. So it shouldn't be considered a silver bullet. And again, password managers, for example, 1Password, uh, they help and use um, uh, the two-factor authentication so that you can use it uh, more readily. Again, if you have availability of setting up two-factor authentication uh, that uh, you can integrate into your, into your just uh, having it uh, text to your phone, that's better than not having it. But also realize that if somebody's really determined to get in, they can spoof your SIM card. And when it sends the text message with the two-factor authentication, the code, they can actually see a copy of that and start doing that. So if you have a choice, yes, set it up on the phone. That's better than not having it at all. But if you have a choice, kind of the next layer of protection is set it up through an independent tool. There is Google Authenticator, there is 1Password, et cetera, et cetera. And Melissa, you need to tell, you need to introduce us to your puppy. I don't know if What's you also puppy? noticed, I also don't know if you noticed Melissa's comment that her people all whine about two-factor authentication, that they don't like to use it. Well, to, to, to kind of wrap this all up, summary is, you know, it's, it's, it's a fight for online privacy and security together. And if, if hopefully you've taken away a number of things from this presentation, but if there is, is one thing of how the lens through which I encourage people to think about this topic is, the level, of the, it's, it's layers of security and layers of improvement. You're not gonna go out there and suddenly encrypt everybody's laptops and set up two-factor authentication and everything, everything, everything. Just do one thing at a time, implement it, get people used to it, just, just layer it. Because the key part here is, is are you making it easy for somebody um, to hack you, to steal your data, to get into your computer and so on and so forth. If you need a kind of a mindset for protection, uh, think about it from two standpoints. What do you have and what do you know? Uh, those are two aspects that when combined provide an extremely secure uh, point of verification. That is an example of the two-factor authentication, right? What do you know? Meaning you go in, you put in your username and password, you know the password, and then what do you have? Either your phone or 
uh, your Google Authenticator or something like that, right? There is other layers of physical uh, called YubiKeys or, or other validation devices that are used in much more advanced uh, areas. But in your organization, you can just, every time you're looking at adding a layer of security, is it something you know? Is it something you have? Can you combine them together? Can you improve what you already have? Adam, I'll let you close it out. Sure. I think uh, my last words to everyone is, I think, just like try to know yourself and have a healthy skepticism, a reasonable paranoia. Just like if it feels wrong, it probably is. Trust your instincts. Online, we have to be a little bit paranoid. It's better to be safe than sorry when we're handling private information like this. Um, I think it's okay to confirm, neither confirm or deny things. We should train people about not easily giving out information that it's okay to take our time and sit on things to confirm communications using other methods if we're a little bit suspicious because most of these cyber attacks are starting out with psychology nowadays. And there are tech things we can do to protect ourselves but I think the idea is basically a computer or a phone is like a glorified calculator and we can never trick it that two plus two equals five. But with people, we have a, a different vulnerability like this. And that's what a lot of modern cyber attacks are taking advantage of. So we fight for privacy and security together in our organizations. Let's implement these five things. Let's do training about all this stuff and Let's um, do research about tech organizations we're partnering with. Do they take security seriously? Are they security conscious? What do they have in place? Um, so I'll leave it open-ended with that, I think. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Adam. And I'm sure that Peter and Adam are happy to stay on for a couple extra minutes if anybody does have questions that they want addressed, but um, in respect of everyone's time or at the top of the hour, so um, we're gonna wrap up. And like I said, I'm sure um, Adam and Peter are happy to stay if anyone has a question they wanna make sure gets addressed. Feel free to unmute and, and ask a question or uh, I'll put it in the chat and uh, right. we're happy to, to address any, any inquiries. Actually, I don't know if you can unmute. So either raise your oh. hand or just wave your hand at the screen or there's a raise hand thing. Are we good? All right, well, you guys know how to reach us. Um, thank you so much for coming and being a part of it. Um, we've got another event coming up in two weeks from today, February 17th. So hopefully we'll see you guys there. And um, if you need anything in the meantime or have any questions, let us know. We'll send out the slides and a whole bunch of links um, from today's presentation um, with the follow-up from this. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank Bye. you.